so I've been here at Thelma Springers and well, the foundation started a few years ago, but um, I've been here since 85. So, shocking. And so, um, I have had a chance, I've known John for, or seen John now for many, many years and known him for a while. Um, it's, great, it's a great pleasure to have him here today. Um, and I want to just say that um, he was gracious to come back in May. We had a book sale in May with our first one, and he came in for a bit to um, take a few hours to sign his books and talk with visitors. So we're lucky to have him back to give us more insight on his books. I'm going to go through a little bit of his bio that I looked up online and added a little bit of my own uh, in, uh, background as well. But John can describe his love of sports and how he started writing officially for the U University of Pennsylvania School newspaper, the Daily Pennsylvania, 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 <laughs> and how he eventually moved to Baltimore and joined the Baltimore Sun. And he was with the Sun since 84 and spent two decades as a columnist covering major events around the globe while also paying close attention to the local teams, the Ravens, Orioles, um, Terrapins. I would see John at Preakness time down at Pimlico because I was sometimes working in the press box, and so I knew he covered racing. And his bio online says he wrote 3,000 columns for the newspapers, won more than 20 awards, witnessed historic sports achievements such as Cal Ripken's Ironman streak, Tiger Woods Masters, um, Michael Jordan game six masterpiece, and both the Super Bowls, the Ravens Super Bowls, in 2020. 2001 and 2013, and covered five Olympics. But I also read that he wanted to write a book, and the first book that was published was in 1986 about Kentucky Derby winner Bill T. He has since written four more books on horse racing, from historic times to modern day heroes. And during some of the writings of his books, we'd see him in our library on Fedonia Road, in the Maryland Horse Breeders Library. And it was cool to see the process of having someone come in and doing research and the creative process of that. I, I want to add on my personal note, for years after he, John had left the Baltimore Sun, I would read his columns on the Ravens website, and which he did for 10 years, from 2012 to 2022, and I all, always enjoyed his take on the game and his points about the games and stuff. And so his, he also has his newest book here today. Um, it came out in September and it's about football. It's titled Rocket Man, Men, the Black Quarterbacks Who Revolutionized Pro Football, and covers from the pioneers to the success of the you know, recent greats, including Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. So, guess who I'm rooting for this weekend or on Sunday? <laughs> and it's really cool that John was able to do all that too. So, now with no further ado, or more further ado, I will introduce John to talk about his contributions to racing. Uh, but I, I did follow horse racing, the Triple Crown, like everybody. 
But then I, I, I started writing sports in Dallas after, after college, my hometown. And then I took a job here in 1984, writing sports for the Baltimore Sun. And in 1985, <coughs> excuse me, right off the bat, they sent me to the Derby. And so it was exciting for me. I'd watched the Kentucky Derby growing up, but I had you know, never, been, never been to Louisville, never been close. Is this working? Yeah. Um, so I got to go. Goodness. So, uh, so anyway, I went with, uh, you know, I wasn't the turf rider. Dale Austin was a name. Some of you may remember was the Baltimore Sun turf rider. And he really, he, he took me by the hand. And so that's that first year I sort of was, found out how it worked, you know, that you got up really early and you went to the barns and that's, everything, every interview took place before 8 a.m. And so it was a whole, you, you were up early and, and, and then you could spend the day riding. And uh, what I remember about that first year was they said, all right, at the end of the week, we want you to pick, pick your, pick a winner for, you know, in the Saturday morning paper. So. I picked a winner, and I mean, I picked a horse, and the horse won. It was spin the buck. All right, won, won the Derby. So everybody's like, hey, you picked the winner at the Derby, you know, in your first year. This is easy. Uh, no problem. Uh, but I don't think I ever picked the winner again. <laughs> but uh, the first year. But what I really liked right off the bat was it was just such a, from a story, I and mean, what I do as a writer, I like, to, I'm a storyteller, boy, horse racing. It was as rich as it got. You, you, you know, not only had these wonderful, wonderful uh, athletes, the animals, but uh, you had, you know, the, the wealthy that owned the horses. You had the people in the barns working with the horses, the trainers, the jockeys. It was just so, so many stories. It was almost uh, you could almost take your pick uh, on the backside, the barns, the jock work, the jock rooms, all over the track. So. Uh, by 1987, the Sun had given me an opinion column, which uh, back in the glory days of newspapers was what you wanted. So I, I had a, a pretty cool, I, I, I had a column, and there was another guy at the Sun that had a column, and he didn't like horse racing. So I went every year to the dirt. Um, so that, that was great. It was one of my favorite assignments. I would spend the week in Kentucky. People would say, you could spend a week, in, week there for a two-minute horse race. But uh, you would go just to, to find out the stories and write columns about the favorites or whatever whatever I uncovered. And you know, Dale Austin was with me. He was the turf rider, and he held me by the hand and kept saving me from making mistakes uh, in so many places. Little, just the littlest things, like if you're writing a fraction time, a speed fraction time, speed fraction time, don't put decimal points. Use fractions. All right. A little mistake like that, he said. You know, people read that, they'll know you're not for real. So there were all sorts of stuff like that. Be very careful with drawing conclusions about bloodlines. I mean, we, we, and we had a lot of long, long talks. It was a real education. Uh, and so in, in 1992, I'm at the Derby, and uh, all eyes are on this horse named Arazi. Arazi is a, a, a French import uh, with great speed and was going to come in here. And was, uh, this was long before there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of horses from international horses uh, coming to the Breeders' Cup and everything. So it was sort of exotic that Orazi was supposed to win. He doesn't win. It turns out the, the, the winner of the race is Lily T, a uh, little known horse. Uh, and it turned out that uh, he had been foaled probably 45 minutes from here, uh, just across the PA line in New Freedom. And so the editor, of the sports editor asked me, can you put a, a feature story together in time for the previous? And I got back from the Derby and I said, sure. So I went up to the, to the farm and started digging into the history of Lily T. And, and I, 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 found, I hit what I thought was storytelling gold. Very modest reading, especially for a Derby winner. Uh, nearly died as a yearling. Uh, sold for, I believe, $2,000. Uh, Kentucky Derby winner sold for that. And then and then is uh, really ill and just overcomes it all. I felt like I'd seen the movie. Uh, so, and I had been in the back of my mind uh, thinking, I, I want to write a book. I, I was just writing newspaper columns. I was in my 30s, late 30s. I grew up a reader. My mother owned a bookstore. Uh, that was my first job, uh, was working in my mother's bookstore uh, in Dallas. I was an English major. 
So, you know, I was looking for it. I thought, you know, I'm looking for a story that seems like one that I can really expand and, 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 and go to town with. So I had no idea what to do. So I had no literary agent. I didn't have a publisher. Um, so I sent a, uh, the article I wrote for The Sun, I sent it to uh, an editor at the University of Kentucky Press. It seemed just, I mean, what, you know, it seemed like if anybody would be interested in horse racing, it would be the University of Kentucky Press. And he wrote me right back, and they, they wanted it. And uh, so I wound up with a contract, and off I went. And uh, the idea that this was the subject for my first book was really kind of crazy in a way. I, I knew the intricacy. I was a sports writer, sports columnist. I knew the intricacies of football, baseball, basketball, far better than horse racing. You know, covered the Triple Crown. Wrote the Preakness and the Derby every year, but I wasn't a real turf rider per se. I was kind of a drive-by turf rider, is the best way to put it. So, but I, I started researching this book. I just relied on the tools of my profession, what I learned from that point, nearly two decades in newspapers. You just you, you start talking to people, you dig in, you find everybody you can talk to about this story. Um, you uh, go back to the newspaper archives and and start spinning, start make the extra phone call, start telling this story. Don't take no for an answer. So yes, I spent long days uh, in the Maryland Horse Breeders uh, Library on Padonia Road, and they were so nice to me. I had young children, I'd go there to research uh, and write, I'd be in there all day, and I, I kind of felt like the staff would kind of peer in at me and look at me, and sort of feel sorry for me. It's like, that's the guy writing a book about Lily T. It's like, who would do that? <laughs> so, actually a good question, but uh, anyway, it was a great story. Uh, that, you know, Breeder, he was no Vanderbilt or Whitney. Uh, it was a guy named Larry Littman, a guy from Philadelphia. That, uh, had, he was a high school dropout and had sort of gotten into racing, into breeding, and it wasn't even at the Derby, wasn't even watching the Derby. Uh, he was uh, down in Florida with his wife, he knew a horse he bred, uh, had, was in the Derby, and maybe he's going to go to dinner with his wife. And, you know, the, the horse comes from behind. Uh, it's a very dramatic race. Razi is ahead, and then Lily T makes this dramatic charge at the end and wins. And so suddenly he was the breeder of the Derby winner. It's something everybody wants, right? And so uh, he was working at an industrial park up in, outside Philadelphia, so I went up and interviewed him. Uh, the jockey was Pat Day, great story there, future Hall of Famer. The trainer was Lynn White. Uh, Lynn uh, was a son of such a, a horseman's horseman, was the son of a trainer. His father had trained going back to the 30s, uh, one of those old school horsemen. The horse came first, uh, would never do anything wrong to a horse, and would never even run a horse in a race. He couldn't win it. Uh, Lyle White, and uh, Lynn was a chip off the old block. He barely run horses in the Derby before that. He only entered Lily T because he thought he had a chance to win. Turned out he was right. Now Lynn, a lot like Dale Austin, had taken me by the hand. Lynn White took me by the hand and, and really unfurled this story for me. How this could possibly happen, a long shot like this. And uh, another guy that, I, you know, just uh, really a tip of the cap. I have so much, uh, I have so, I, I'm so thankful that, that he was helpful to me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the horse sold for 2000 bought out of a run-of-the-mill Ocala sale, uh, he, and he was pinhooked. He was pinhooked. Uh, bought for 2000 sold for 3000 I didn't even know what a pinhooker was. And so, uh, you know, I went down to Florida, I interviewed the pinhooker. So, uh, you know, I learned a lot, so I, I wrote this book, and it, it came out in 1996. I couldn't have asked for anything more. Uh, you know, you go to Kentucky, there's book signings, there's, there's uh, you know, the author fantasy of holding a book in your hand, you know, so everybody write, don't let anybody tell you any different. The first time you do it, you do it because you want to hold it, a book, your book you wrote in your hand, and that's my experience with uh, Lily T, The Longest Shot. And so I even uh, optioned the film rights for, uh, I, I thought, oh, this is, this is easy, this is really fun, and uh, Needless to say, uh, the film didn't go anywhere. But uh, uh, so that was uh, that was great, and so I had written a book. And once you've written one book, you're you're better positioned to to write more. Uh, having 
having done that, I was able to acquire a uh, literary agent in New York, uh, and, uh, and we would have a long partnership and do a bunch of books. I wrote a book uh, about, my next book was about growing up in Dallas uh, as a fan of the Dallas Cowboys. I wrote, so a football book, and then I wrote an on oral history of the Baltimore Orioles. I went around, I was covering them every day, went around, interviewed, like every, every guy that ever played for the team practically, and, and this was in the late 90s, and uh, so that book came out. But then in the early 2000s, I don't know, I don't know exactly the year Seabiscuit, the book came out, but at uh, some point in the early 2000s, that book came out and suddenly publishing like, you know, lots of other industries are looking they're copycats, and suddenly everyone's looking for the next great horse book. Uh, all these editors. Uh, and so uh, an editor at Warner Books, a pretty good publisher, calls uh, my agent and said, do, do you know anyone with a horse story? And so my agent calls me and said, do you, you wrote a horse book? Do you, do you, do you have a horse story? And, and the answer was, I did. Uh, reason being, when I was promoting Lily T, uh, going through that, I came in contact with a woman named Olive Kuhn. Olive uh, was one of a kind. She lived in D.C. She was a true horse racing aficionado. She lived in Washington. She worked in the classified ad department of the Washington Post. But what she was, first and foremost, was a horse racing fan. She actually started a club uh, for horse racing fans, D.C. based, called the Rail Sitters. And she was a, a all I can say is a, a force of nature. She really was, uh, just loved it so much that so she sort of adopted me and, and uh, you know, was always uh, asking how things were going. And she had a crush on Alfred Vanderbilt. <laughs> the, the late Alfred Vanderbilt. And so, from the icon iconic family. And, of course, very briefly, you know, Alfred's father had gone down on the Lusitania, right, in 1912, um, when he was a young man, married to Margaret Emerson, who uh, Margaret came from, it's the Bromo Seltzer, uh, Captain Emerson, who the tower downtown and all that, uh, uh, the daughter of the Barona Seltzer magnate, Margaret Emerson. But Alfred loved horses and racing as a kid. When he turned 21, I think I have this right still, it's been a while since I read the book, his mother basically gave him Sacramento Farm. And uh, so, which her father had built. So Alfred was a man of racing, man of horses, one of the foremost of the 20th century, he bred horses, a man come with go, he sat in front row at Saratoga, and uh, he bred native dancer, uh, one of the greatest horses to never win a triple crown. Uh, won 21 out of 22 starts, big gray, and Olive, in the, uh, you know, had, was trying to talk me into writing a biography of Alfred Vanderbilt. She said, you're the man to do this. And so she, what she would do was buy things on eBay and send them to me. She would send the Art New Yorker articles, uh, Life Old Life magazines. So uh, I had a ton of stuff on Alfred Vanderbilt, and some of it, some of it was uh, about being a dancer. So when my agent says, "Do you have a horse story?" I'm literally sitting in my office. I turn and I look at this stack of stuff that Olive has sent me on Alfred Vanderbilt. I said, "Well, yeah, I do. I do have a horse story. I have a great horse, native dancer." And so, you know, the, the timing was right. Uh, that idea sold. And so, uh, in the early, the, the Nate Dancer story is, is a great, great story. Uh, he raced in the early 50s when race, horse racing was probably second to, to baseball, his most popular sport. Maybe boxing was with it. The sports landscape was a lot different in the early 50s than it is now. Definitely was ahead of pro football, which was just starting to go. It was not that big of a deal in the early 50s. Horse racing was huge. Uh, the subtext to the story of Native Dancer is he became popular winning these races in the early 50s when the, that's the first decade of television, the 1950s, and they started televising these races. And Native Dancer would go, come around, you know, come from behind and win these nationally televised races. No one had ever seen this before. And uh, they were all in black and white, and people could spot him because he was gray. It was a gray horse, and he just became a huge TV star. Um, and really, I mean, the first generation of TV stars, you know, that's like Milton Berle, you know, maybe the, the, the people that really in the 50s, and Native Dancer was one of them. He's on the cover of Time Magazine, uh, a horse that did not win the Kentucky Derby. So uh, I found the people, I had a deal to write this 
book. And so I found the people who tell the story. I have Alfred's son, uh, Alfred the Third, goes by. So basically my age, a little bit older. Uh, and we hit it off, and he was very excited that uh, I think, number one, that I was not writing a biography of his father, but it was excited that I was writing about being a dancer <clears throat> with his father sort of as part of the story. Um, the trainer of the horse is in the Hall of Fame, Bill Winfrey. Uh, his son, Kerry, went to McDonough and was the editor of Smithsonian Magazine. So if you want to talk about a goal line, one journalist to another, and he was there for the whole thing. So he, he remembered it all, and so we spent a lot of time together. And of course, around here, how far are we from Sacramento? Not far. There's, there's just tons of people that had worked there, that had painted the fences in the summer, that just had all these stories about native dancer. One guy uh, told me that he used to live just over the PA line, and he would drive into Towson, and he had all these memories, because I just sort of put it out. I can't remember, it wasn't on social media, but somehow uh, advertised with your native dancer stories, and they, people were just calling me. And this guy said, I would be, it was on my commute, and I would drive by a native dancer who in his uh, later years was uh, stood at um, Sacramore, would be running through the field all white, the gray had gone all white. And just, he said, I'll never forget that, one of the most dramatic things you'll ever see. And so there were all these stories, um, and you know, there was, again, my, my horse racing, uh, our storytelling goal. Uh, so I took a year off from the newspaper uh, to write that book because uh, it was it was pretty it was a pretty big subject, and I really wanted to devote time to it. And it came out in the early two thousands, like two thousand three, I think. Again, and again, very nicely received, and 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 it's, it's so nice to spend so much time with the story and put it out, and to have it be so warmly received by so many people and go around and do book signings and talk to people. And I still hear from people about uh, Native Dancer. So after that book came out, I went back to the Sun. Uh, you know, was uh, went back to writing columns. Uh, and I was still looking for another book. I got into this. I was sort of had two writing lives. Uh, I had the daily sports journalism, writing about the Orioles, the Ravens, uh, whatever happened. Uh, and then writing these books, and it really was two very different rails. I mean, whatever you wrote in the newspaper, you wrote it usually on deadline in about 45 minutes in some loud stadium, and you hoped that it made sense, and people would, you know, not always tell you that they agreed with you, and I'm being about as nice as I can here. And, you know, you, you put something out there in the newspaper or whatever it may be, you're, you're asking for it. And so anyway, and then the books would be the opposite. It would just be my story uh, for a year or longer, however long it takes to write it. And nobody saw it. And then finally, reluctantly, give it to the editor and, and it comes out. And uh, you go forth from there. Very different uh, uh, writing, types of writing. But, um, and, you know, I liked them both. Uh, and so I was really, really lucky. As, as, as I looked at it, and was somehow able to do it. Uh, but um, I was looking for another book idea. And I really had no, uh, uh, I'd written, written this horse racing book. I, I love, love the storytelling of it. So on a Friday night, just a simple Google search, right? I'm Googling around, and I came across an academic paper a guy had written uh, on uh, an event that I had never heard about. It was a match race between the fastest horse in the north and the fastest horse in the south in 1823. Right? There, was a, there was a match race. Uh, and there were 60,000 people there. Uh, the race was held outside New York, uh, where Aqueduct is now. Uh, out on a, they had a race course there, the Union course. And um, 60,000 people, I looked it up, that was three times the population of Delaware in 1823. So it's like, th this is pretty incredible what, what happened here. And so it, I sort of, my wheel started turning and I was thinking, you know, my background in sports, this is way before football, way before baseball, way before basketball. This, this was the first major sports event in America. It really was. Um, 
Is the, maybe there have been some running races before that, or you know, can you throw something really far? I mean, really, really early sports is, is pretty simple, but for just sort of the thing that we're used to, the crowd gathers, the roar of the crowd, this was the first one. Uh, and the event itself defined belief to a knowledgeable racing person when I was reading in the 2000s. This match race was the best two out of three heats. And so and they run, they weren't run on different days. They ran one after the other after the other. Uh, and those heats were four miles each. <laughs> so now, I had, as I said, I had covered a lot of racing. And uh, I know that there had been a lot of study of early racing. I didn't really know this. I didn't know that this is what constituted racing. Four mile heats. And so uh, the, the race, the great match race, it went to all three heats, so the, those, the horses raced 12 miles that afternoon. It was a May afternoon in New York. Uh, and there was a dramatic jockey change, and not to, I'm not, not to give it away, but as the final heat came down to the end, the crowd surged onto the track, and then the horses were running through the crowd, and I'm reading this sort of dry, I have to say, academic paper, and I'm going, this is like the most unbelievable thing I've ever read. Is, is this actually happen? And so, just an insane event. So, I knew, I absolutely knew. I said, that, that's my book right there. There's no doubt about it. Uh, so, uh, I had no problem selling that one. Once I worked up a book proposal to an editor at Houghton Mifflin, which is a great old line uh, publisher in Boston. And that was the start of a, a great thing. The, the woman editor who bought it uh, uh, was a big sports fan, sports publisher, and we would go on to publish four books together. And then she would get out of publishing. She's now my agent. So a really great relationship with her. And she had the vision for, for this book that I did. The Great Match Race, it's called. And that was a whole different research experience. Uh, obviously, 1823, there's no one to talk to. So I had to go way, way down the research rabbit hole. I mean, way down. Newspaper accounts, so I immersed myself in like the journalism of the early 1800s, all these. But the newspapers, uh, now it's much easier online, but back then you could go to the Library of Congress in Washington, they were all on microfilm. You could go read the different newspapers from the 1820s. They all had a point of view. I mean, you want to talk about the media today, every newspaper had a point of view in the 1820s. So. You, you had to think a little bit about you know, what you were reading, but a lot of them covered this race. Uh, and the papers, the end of it, the paper, the trainers of these horses were, were famous people. Uh, and so you, you, they, they donated their papers after they died. Uh, the trainer was Cornelius Van Ranks, unbelievable name. I, I didn't make that up. Uh, and William Henry Johnson of the South, his papers were at Duke University. You go down and found all this stuff they would written about it. Uh, so uh, the horses were Eclipse uh, was the, the horse of the North. Sir Henry was the horse of the South. So I immersed myself in the landscape of early American horse racing. Uh, you you found unbelievable things. The Pratt Library downtown in the Maryland Reading Room, they had sports journals from the 1820s. In, on the shelves. So I, I go down there and, and I'm, so I, I talk to the librarian, I said, can I touch it? You know, I mean, this is like a home that's 175 years old. And they said, oh, you can, can I check it out? You know, and they were like, no, you can't check it out. But you can, so I would have, but uh, it was, you can carry it around, you can copy it. It was in pretty good shape, 175 year old journals. So you could actually find all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and, you know, that was great. And I learned about the 1820s horse racing. And so I had, went to New York, the Historical Society. I had to learn about New York in the 1820s and, and how in the world did they get 60,000 people to, a, a, you know, outside there on one day, the three times the population of Delaware. How did that, all that happen? It was just this crazy story. And there's so many storylines to it. it. Fundamentally, the, the, the horse racing aspect of it was great. Um, Eclipse was the northern chip. The southerners were the horse people. Right? The southerners were like, we, we definitely are better than the northerners uh, at, at horses and racing. So, you know, we're definitely better than them, that's for sure. 
and uh, so the, and but the Northerners had the horse. Eclipse was undefeated. It was an older horse. I think he was nine years old, and it was an undefeated horse. They never beat him. So the Southerners went on this great sort of uh, trial races to find the horse to challenge Eclipse in this match race. So I found all this. They went through all this and weeded out the people and settled on uh, Sir Henry, who was four and fast as could be. So it was the aging, undefeated champion against the young speedster, you know, just brimming with talent. It was also totally a clash. I mean, the Civil War wasn't for another over 30 years, but, uh, you know, this was like the first shot of the Civil War. It was, they were, and, you know, the North and the South were, were, were not happy about this whole, you know, we're better at the horses, and, uh, you know, it, it, things got, got very heated, and come to find out the, uh, so heated that I, I discovered many things researching this. The, the phrase, bet the farm, which we've all heard of, it came from this race because that's what the Southerners were doing. They were betting the farm. They were betting their farms on, on this race. And so people got very passionate about it. The whole, I'm not going to give it away, but the, 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 uh, the whole concept of delivering the news to people uh, in 1823, and it took days for people to find out what happened after the race. So, uh, you know, just uh, really, really uh, a fascinating story. The book came out in 2006. Uh, I've written 11 now. Well, my 11th on football just came out in the fall. And I will say, I feel like the Grange match, match race, you know, one of my best and one, one of the ones I'm really proud of because that was a research rabbit hole. And there was a lot to it. Uh, my editor, I mean, the whole issue of, uh, we got into a really, not to get into the weeds here, but uh, I, you know, I said to her, I said, there's no dialogue in this book and she said put it in and I said this is nonfiction this this is nonfiction all right we, we she said put it in and try and just say admit it in the author's note that you know you you might have you know done what you thought people would say and I said and I'm a, you know I'm like a hamster on what I'm a journalist I can't even make it up dialogue so she said try it so I gave her I did it so I gave her a version with some dialogue in it. And she, <laughs> she said back to me, too much dialogue. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so let me see what I can do here. So dialed it way back. And indeed, I did put in, I mean, I only, and it's very limited, and I did what I, I, you know, having read about these people, sort of assumed what they would say in a few situations. Really limited it. And yeah, I put it in the author's note. And that was an interesting experience. The, 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 the response was fine. People were saying, well, he, you know, he said what he's doing here, and uh, it's, well, it just about everybody said it's fine with us because what a story. And so I appreciated that a lot. Uh, and no one seemed to mind. So I, I will say, never again have I done that because I was not comfortable doing that at all. And uh, it was, that was just an interesting little part of it. Uh, I've heard on and off for years from production companies about, about uh, movie production companies about this, this story, and it should be a movie. Uh, the most recent company that was really interested were, they were British. It's such an American story, but a British production company was really, really interested. Didn't get over a couple of hurdles. We'll see what happens uh, in the long run with it. But, uh, you know, that, that one was a lot of fun. Uh, I was still going to the Derby. This is uh, 2006 uh, that came out. I was still going to the Derby and covering the greatness. And I was in Pimlico in 2006 when Barbara broke down uh, right in front of me. And, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to forget that. It says in the press box, which is great overhang, it just all happened right in front of me. Uh, I had a sports editor turn to me, look at me, and say, is this a big deal? I said, this is a big deal, and it's awful. Just heartbreaking. And of course, it's the only time the previous I covered a lot of them, and it uh, became a breaking news situation. And the horse gets banned, uh, you know, gets put in uh, 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 you know, an ambulance, and then banned up to Pennsylvania.
Pennsylvania that night as it was happening, and uh, it was all developing very quickly. And of course, then his story, if you all remember, for the rest of the year, the, the, what was happening with, with Barbara and how the, the vets at the New Bolton Clinic uh, were, New Bolton, is that correct? Kennedy Square, Pennsylvania? Uh, were trying to save him and reconstruct his leg. And of course, the, public, the sports public just lived and died with every headline and every story. Uh, and so I had a, a media friend uh, who, who knew the job, Edward Prado, who's well known around here, very successful in Maryland for many years. Uh, it was his first and only Derby winner. Uh, and so uh, this media friend said, boy, there is, a, there is quite a deal going on with this horse because Edgar, on his days, I mean, long ago had not raced, was not racing in Maryland, he was in New York. I mean, did have a house here. <clears throat> but he was going down to visit Barbara on his day off. Or some, sometimes on a race day, really, if he was racing at night, say. He's just going in. He doesn't want attention for this. He doesn't. He's just doing it. Go down and see the horse. Whew. So uh, that that was quite a story. So the media friend who knew Edgar said, you know, Edgar is interested. He doesn't necessarily, you know, he, he wants a, a book to come out as a tribute to this great horse. Kid, what do you think? And I said, I, I said that sounds like a pretty good story uh, to me. So he got Edgar and I together. And we talked, and I really liked Edgar. I'd written columns about him when uh, I was at the Sun, and he was so successful here in Maryland as a young man. He was older now; he had teenage kids, and and um, so we decided well, let's let's do this. Let's uh, we'll tell the story, and we sort of hashed out what it would be. Not just I, I felt like it had to be not just the story of the horse; that'd be Edgar's story too. Uh, how did he get to this point? Uh, and uh, he's from Peru and come to America and was so successful. And we decided it would be in his voice, his book, with, with me writing, uh, ghostwriting, basically. And so this was definitely, this was a popular sports story. The publishers were bidding for it. They wanted it. Um, and so Edgar uh, is, uh, I found him a lovely guy, Hall of Fame jockey, down to earth, but he's down to earth. He's smart. Uh, you know, he come come to America and made it as a jockey. And we sat down to interview probably forty hours of interviews, and at different locales. And after a while, you realize how Edgar was doing in this world because we sat down at his house uh, outside New York uh, near Belmont. We sat down at his house uh, in South Florida near. Uh, Hollywood Park. We sat down in his house in Saratoga, which he owned the house there, and the one in Maryland. And so he had a lot of houses. Edgar was doing well. And it was so interesting to sort of be in his, his thrall for a while. Everything was in cash. I mean, it was really up close to look at the jockey's world. And he went to Dubai while we were in the middle of it. We were, um, we were working on this. He went to Dubai and won, won one of those races. And got paid him like cat. I think he had a check for a quarter of a million dollars or something, whatever his cut was. And he says, Yes, I came up with cash. I said, Was it like, you know, were you, you like a briefcase full of, full of cash? He goes, No, it was a check. So it was all in cash. That's how he was operating. I mean, he didn't, Edgar did not go to college, but, you know, he was very, very sharp. And people would say, You're, you're writing a, a book with a guy in English as a second language? I mean, how are you doing that? Meanwhile, he's getting his real estate investments sent to his, you know, his iPhone. You know, he's signing. I mean, Edgar was a very sharp guy. Uh, I liked him a lot. Um, we wrote the book, and uh, it's the only time I've been a ghostwriter. And uh, the challenge was finding the right voice. As I said, English, I mean, English was not his first language. He was fluent, but it was not his first language. And so I was afraid to use certain words. I didn't really know how to do that. What, what, there's certain words you write along. And it's like, I don't think Edgar's using that word. And uh, finally, the editor uh, said, just use them. Just, just use what, just write it to your voice. And maybe we'll tweak it a little bit. And so uh, just go for it, write what you like. And it worked out fine. 
And so I wrote it, and I'll always remember the last time we met, or not the last time, but I drove up, I had finished it, and I drove up to read it to him. And he had broken, he had had a spill, and he was not riding. This was at, at Belmont. So he was just laid up at his house. He said, come on up. So I literally read the book to him. I got there in the morning, read the whole book to him. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what he would think. I didn't know anything. And so we get to the end, and needless to say, it's, it's a sad story. Because in the end, Barbara was put down. And uh, it was the only thing, the only way it had to be. And so the book tells his story, it tells Barbara's story. And, uh, and you know, I'm finished reading it to him. And it's like twilight, and he's, uh, you know, sitting in the chair across from me. He goes, he's beautiful. Yes. So I said, great, thank you. So uh, he was uh, a great collaborator, and uh, I really enjoyed my time with Edgar. I, I still hear from him occasionally. And uh, it's kind of cool, you know, when Edgar Prado, back in my memory, won a Breeders' Cup race a few years ago. Because he's retired now, he's in his late fifties, and I thought, well, I haven't talked to Edgar in a while, but I'm going to send him a text and say congratulations, and heard right back from him. So a very, 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 very nice guy. Um, I left the Baltimore Sun in 2007 after 23 years, and uh, I started writing, uh, you know, books full time. Uh, I thought I was done with horse racing really at that point. I started to write some football books. But then I got a call from an old friend in the press box. Uh, her name is Jackie Duke. She uh, was, when I was in the press boxes, working for the Lexington Hero Leader. She was a business writer. She did some horse racing. And she got out of newspapers and was the editor of the Eclipse Press, which is the book arm of the Blood Horse magazine. And so it was a nice job. And she was Lexington, living in Lexington. She was friendly with... Anthony Beck. Anthony Beck is the owner of Gainesway Farm in Lexington. Uh, of course, one of the biggest, most successful, uh, they say Tappet, the, the uh, sire, who I don't know if the, what it is now, certainly one of the most successful and expensive in the country, number one. I think I don't know what it's going for now, but it's a lot. Uh, anyway, uh, Anthony, uh, his father, Graham, uh, they, were, they were from South Africa. And his father made a fortune in South Africa in diamonds, in real estate, and in wine. They were one of the foremost wine producers from uh, South Africa. They love racing. They bought Gainesway Farm uh, in 1989. He had died, uh, Graham had, and Anthony wanted to write a history of the land that this farm is on, the history of Gainesway Farm, uh, for the 25th anniversary of their owning the farm. And this was going to be for his clients. This was not for public sale. And so Jackie Duke said, would you be interested? And I was like, well, sure. I mean, this sounds really interesting. So uh, if we can strike a deal. So got us on the phone. So I'm on the phone with Anthony Beck, who, of course, is, you know, pretty wealthy guy. And I had a price in mind. And so <clears throat> he goes, will you do this? I said, uh, well, here's my price. And he goes, that's great. And I mean, you should have doubled it. I mean, this guy, you know, he can buy and sell just about anything. I, I, I love all myself, I think. But anyway, it was, it was enough. So, a great experience. He gave me the run of the place, pretty much. Uh, when I went there, I stayed in the guest house, which was a 200-year-old uh, farmhouse down at flat screens and, and uh, every convenience you can imagine. Went to the reading shed, and, you know, Tappet is there, and and just the whole experience with barns at Gainesway Farm were award-winning design and won the American Design Award in the 1980s. Uh, uh, I believe beating out the, the Vietnam Memorial. It's an incredible, they're modern, sort of modern design. Just a, just a fantastic place. Um, so, uh, and uh, his, it turned out his wife, uh, Anthony's wife, uh, had, had gone to college where I went, University of Pennsylvania, shortly after me, and she's the daughter of Bob Lee, who some of you all uh, may know is a, a very well-known, wealthy owner of horses and tracks. Uh, and so I can't remember Bob Lee's previous.
previous winner. It's the previous winner, I can't remember, but or, or maybe a Belmont winner. Very pretty big horse racing guy. Anyway, the story of the land, the Gainesway. So I was on to an epic tale. One of the going back over a century, it was owned by a guy I'd never heard of, James Bin Ali Habit. This is the, like 1900. He's, this is a turn of that century, so prominent. His New York Times obituary was like half a page. It's just this huge obituary. This incredible, prominent guy had turned it into a dairy and was profited with, where they had an underground, uh, you know, they, they would put the milk and the ice cream underground. Uh, it was just uh, an amazing place. And he lived extremely large, uh, built stone mansion, built this huge stone mansion columns that look like something out of Rome. And when he died, Joseph Widener, Widener family, bought the land and after about 10 years tore the mansion down rather than pay the property taxes. But he left up the huge front entrance, the stairway and the marble columns. If you're driving along outside there, you can see it's just columns. It's the door to nowhere. It, 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 is, it is there by the side of the road in Lexington. And I guarantee you, for however many years, people have driven by it and said, what is going on there? But that is what happened, and it's still there. Uh, still there. Uh, just a truly a testament uh, to, like, American excess. That's all you can say. The guy built this mansion and got torn down. So the Wideners eventually sold to the Whitney's, uh, and the Whitney's, Huge, of course, uh, C.B. Whitney, these are great racing names from the middle of the 20th century. And uh, they eventually sold to John Gaines. And John Gaines uh, basically invented the modern commercial breeding in the 1960s. He started the breeder stuff. An unbelievable figure. I finished research in this book. I thought there's a guy that deserves a biography. John Gaines. Uh, just a true visionary. And uh, John Gaines is the one that sold to Grand Beck in 1989. So Grand Beck's widow comes from South Africa. Here's what I remember from that. His mother came, Anthony's mother, and she said, you all go for a drive. So someone takes us for a drive around the property. And she was a naturalist. Uh, she had planted thousands of trees. I think thousands of trees on this property. She wanted it to be tree laden and had gone to great lengths to do that. Uh, Anthony put her in charge of it, basically. And so we just drove around and talked. And uh, I remember she uh, had said, she was talking about how uh, this was, would this be like 2009 or 10? And she said, well, I always remember, she said, our wine was served when your fellow, when your fellow, we talked about Nelson Mandela. And she said, oh, well, when your fellow won, she was talking about President Obama. She said, when your fellow won, that's how she referred to it, when your fellow won, uh, uh, they, they served our wine. And I was like, okay, I'll never forget that, your fellow. Um, I made a, a special trip back to interview Mary Lou Whitney, all right, the, the widow of C.B. Whitney, uh, Sonny Whitney, one of the great men of mid-century racing. And of course, uh, Mary Lou Whitney, one of the, the, when she died, uh, it wasn't that long ago, uh, New York Times obituary referred to her as the social queen of the racing world. All right, she basically was the queen of Belmont, the queen of every racing situation she was in. Uh, beautiful and dramatic. And when I interviewed her, she was 90. She was 90 years old. She invited me down to come talk about the old days. She dressed up for it. We had lunch, told me stories. She was flirting with me. She was crying. I mean, it was just not to be believed. And I, I do have it on tape. What a, what a performance. That's all I can say. Um, so, uh, you know, just an unforgettable interview. One of my, I have to say, top five. Uh, the book is in the, it is not for public sale. Uh, it is in the collection here. I gave one here, and I do have one with me today. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's called Hallowed Ground. And uh, is it out somewhere? Uh, right here. Oh, cool. So, yeah, they did a great job with it. Uh, the, the, you know, put, it's a coffee table book. They, they put the pictures together. Gorgeous pictures. It's the most beautiful farm you could ever imagine. It's my words. And, you know, I mean, that book is really why I got started in the first place in, in writing about horse racing. Just the storytelling is just not to be believed. It's so great and fascinating. And just, uh, I just, uh, you know, I do a lot of football and baseball.
baseball, basketball, but I'm not sure from a, the sheer drama. People would say, well, you, you know, why do you keep writing about horse riding? I said, you cannot do better uh, as, as in terms of, of just uh, storytelling. And, uh, you know, the people that own the horses, the people that work with the horses, you really run the, this, the whole human spectrum, and there's always so much drama. And I just uh, have loved it for many years. So, anyway, that's pretty much my journey. I've been writing a lot of football lately. I have a, my most recent football book with me, but I'd love to, to, I can answer any questions if you want about the racing, or about football, if you want to, or about Lamar. <laughs> Happy to answer that. I was with the Ravens up within the last, uh, I think mean, it's been less than, uh, I've only been gone for, me for a year, so. Yeah, I yeah, was going to win, right. Yeah. yeah, let me tell you what people used to say about my predictions. <laughs> I do think the Ravens will win. I do. I agree. So, uh... Somebody that you used to work with, Mike Preston? Yeah, Mike. Yes. Yeah. Uh, him and I got into this yesterday. He calls me early in the morning. He goes, why'd you send me that email? I said, what? I said, how could you not give Lamar an A? Oh, yeah. He gives the grades. Yeah. Mike says, you've got to understand, the Sun paper wants those grades 15 minutes after the game's over. Very true. You guys don't understand you're a fan. <laughs> but it's true. It is very true about that. Like I was saying before, you know, the stuff you write for the paper is really fast. And sometimes you hit the send button and you go, well, A, what did I just say? And B, does it make sense? I sure hope. He said he was in the press box still at 1230. Yep. It was a 3 o'clock game and you're still writing up in the press box. That's right. Yeah, it means a lot of things, though, I'll say, yeah. So, any questions or anything from anyone? Some of the old press guys that wrote, you know, just the racing writers, oh. the characters there alone would be story time. I'm sure all the newsroom is crazy, but there were some really interesting old racing writers. Oh, man, well, you know, I got into it. The first Derby in 85, 1985, I'm new to it, and there's a there's gambling window and a beer tap in the press box. Yeah. This is interesting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Not the case at the baseball stadiums or the football stadiums. And these guys are going to the window. I mean, they are going to the window and the beer tap, and it runs all day long. And I thought, well, this this actually is not bad. <laughs> so, and then you know, Joe Hirsch from the Daily Racing Forum. I was a, uh, I mean, I, I'm, uh, uh, you know, been around. I got into it soon enough just to catch you know some of that generation. They were, they, were, they were just great, really, really, really great, sort of, uh, you know, definitely sort of grizzled, the old grizzled sports writers, you know, almost David Runyon types, yeah. but, uh, you know, they were really good at it, and uh, they, they, you know, what Dale Boston taught me all those years ago is how to ask questions of a really good trainer, and don't embarrass yourself when you don't know one one-hundredth as much about horse racing as he does, it's tricky. And he would say, you know, you, you think hard, you know, you think about your question. And uh, some of those old trainers were, were men of few words. And, uh, you know, you better, you better have your, your question. You better know what you're going to ask. So it was, anyway, it was, uh, that, I love that crowd. That crowd was great. The other match race, see Biscuit and more ammo? Right. Uh, I mean, I'm 74 now, but my grandfather went, went to it. And he said that was like, Everything in Baltimore just shut down. Yeah. Right. It just shut down. Well, and he lived a couple of blocks in the track at the Alfred Rock. And Alfred Bennett will put that on. Yeah. I mean, that's that's his production. He was running for the Winner take off. Winner take off. Well, when you started talking about a match race, I thought that's the one you were going to talk about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because I had never heard of the one you talked about. Well, there's some other match races from the 1800s. People, I did hear from some people who were real students of 1850s. Or 30s or 40s horse race. Well, why didn't you think about? I've forgotten the names of some of them, but uh, uh, you know, but the 1820s horse racing. It was really interesting to study and, and find out about how it was so completely different, but in some some ways still the same. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Went to the track in those days, and a lot of people went in sport coats and ties. You didn't have oh, yeah. to even, you know the elite always did, but you know, big days you always know, dressed up a little bit. Right. I'm sure you know it, but your, your great match race has its own special corner in the National Museum of Racing. Uh, you know that? 
What I know is, no, I don't. I mean, what, what I do know is that the cover of the book, uh, I went to the National Museum of Racing, and it, there's a beautiful tap, the, the, the tapestry, uh, I, I took pictures of it, and, and they wound up using it as the cover of the book. It had three different pieces, beautiful tapestry. And so, yeah. How, how they moved the crowd in and out that day, I mean, yeah. they had to have a ferry, right? Ferry, is exactly right. They, yeah, they, a lot of them stayed in New York. It's amazing how similar it was to, you know, they stayed in New York. Yes, see here, the cover, this, the hardcover of this book, see, it's all three, one beat, two beat, third beat. It's a beautiful tapestry. I mean, it's in the Hall of Fame. And uh, I saw that. And it's got the names, uh, the Union course, May 27th. Actually, just had the 200th anniversary in May.
That's a really good question. And I mean, I've got to speak to a lot of journalism classes. I mean, and I, I have known people say, you know, the, the, the thing is, the, the, my model, you know, what I lived through, it's, it's dying. I mean, there's still a few good newspapers or, that, you know, at least have breadth, but my, the Baltimore Sun, that sort of level, they're all struggling. But there are places out there. I mean, the internet does provide, uh, I mean, the whole media world is sort of blown up, and, you know, it's no longer just these sort of legacy of, of institutions. It's now a bunch of places, and you can find places that you can still do the same stuff. It's just harder to find. All I can say to them is, you know, if you really have a story and, and you believe in it, uh, you know, write it and, and, and try to, I mean, there are, everything's turned upside down, you know, the, the football teams, if you told me all those years that I was writing for the Sun, that I would work for the Ravens, uh, you know, inside the walls for writing about them, that was, you know, that would be 101 of what you're not supposed to do. All right, but so the world turns upside down, and they're the ones with some money and some some uh, you know editorial. I mean, they 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 had the money and the platform and the eyeballs, and they said we we want you. Uh, and I said, well, how's this going to work? And they said, we don't care what you write. And I said, even if it's negative, and they said we'll be fine. And I said, well, let's see how this goes. And it, and it, and you know, it went okay for the most part. I mean, I think there were a few days when the coach would sort of say, no, am I making a why is he in the lunch line, you know, in front of me after having ripped something, you know, whatever. But so it, everything's upside down. It's very hard to just say, here's your course, but the, the institution, there are places where there's money and opportunity, and you have to find them. Uh, but if you really are passionate about it, you know, just start writing it and and find some place, somebody that's willing to help you tell your story. Is that what you tell the young journalists that you teach them? Yeah, I say, you know, if you if you really believe, I mean, the journalism school at the University of Maryland, they're churning out some really good people. And so and they wind up in, uh, in pretty good jobs. I mean, maybe it's not Baltimore Sun anymore, or maybe it's the Banner, or maybe it's, you know, there's all these entities out there. It depends on, on the, uh, whatever, you know, NFL.com and, and, and football and the teams. I mean, I somehow survived a few years on the team site. I mean, there's different places. You just have to be a little bit more creative than you used to be. The so. Stories are great for what your inside today is very helpful. Thank you. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But you, you hit on something that is, a, that is a real, it's a tough, it's a tough question. You know, scary, John, a little bit, and I'm, I'm sure you think of it. Because you covered all the pro sports in Maryland at one time, the only thing you could bet on was horse racing. Right. And now pro sports, well, you can bet on whether the next play is going to be a pass or a run. Right. And yeah. That, that, that scares me a little bit. It definitely scares me too. I, I think I think there's going to be an issue at some point down the line with all the gambling. They've already caught a few of the football players uh, betting and not really understanding why it's a problem. Uh, and it's like, well, I mean, maybe somebody sat him down and said, you can play college players, you can play any high school players. Yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. So. It's scary. Yeah. It, it is. It is. I mean, I, I, uh, one of my football books, The League, I wrote about when gambling was just totally pervading the NFL in the 1940s. And gambler's in the locker room. And uh, Burt Bell became the commissioner. And said, Kicked them all out and said, this is why we're going to be transparent. This is why, you know, those injury reports that come out every week during the football, they say, oh, well, here's who practiced today or who didn't all week. You hear about these things. That was done. That traces strictly to that because they wanted, they didn't want gamblers in the locker room trying to find out who's hurt. And uh, because they, that was not public information. So that would impact who they bet on. So to, to think we've gone from that. And the reason he did it is the 1946 championship game almost was there were gamblers trying to talk the New York Giants quarterback into throwing the game the night before the game. And he, for some, I mean, he sort of did. So never really uh, fed, copped up to it. But uh, yeah, so that's happening again with college, and they're trying to get in through the boosters and all that to find out, you know, who's. Yeah, it's, it's, a, a, it's, it's a slippery slope. Probably, <laughs> they don't remember that history, but they're. Yes. Right. It is a slippery slope. 
I think about that all the time. I see it one of those, you know, turn on the TV for two minutes, there's a gambling ad. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I want this. See, now they've got money. They've got a ton of money. And so they're spending it, um, and I think they're doing pretty well. So, so yeah. back to journalists or horse racing, as you said, as you know, because you look at it, there's great stories. And we in this industry are having trouble getting the good stories out. Obviously, the, the focus on that more. You know, so I think whether you can help us through the talks and with journalists, we need younger journalism interest in people, maybe that's, to find these stories. Because horse racing, just as you said, you just have to go back a couple of paces to find the yep. back story. Yeah. And we are not doing it successfully. I mean, I think with our magazine, I'll, I'll you know, promote our own magazine, but that's not enough. You know, we need to get it out in a, more, in a wider, especially now with what's happening with the focus on horse so racing. Do you read the Atlantic thoroughbred? You know, if you, if you, you know, the, whoever the jockeys are, what's their stories, who, the, who are the trainers, where did these horses come from, and the breeders, it's always interesting. That's what I learned. It is always interesting. Yeah, so John is our social media guy, and he loves it, and he finds stories for us, and he, he does our social media. But somebody like that who's passionate about racing and now breeding, we're cultivating that, but, you know, you, you need to give them a audience, a voice, an outlet. Passion that comes through is amazing, and we have to give them a voice. Yeah. Honestly, social media is, a, is a, a, a good way to do it. It has to be now. Right? It has to be. If you want to get younger people, you know. Right. You know. Supposedly, I'm supposed to be selling my books on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The dance? Or you yeah. Know, yeah. You know, they need to be a more do more heads, hands on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been going to the racetrack all my life, and it's just not hands on. How we how do because I mean I'd love it. Well, hopefully we're I mean, gonna. I go, wouldn't be here today. But you just can't go talk to a jockey. You really can't. But I can go talk to a raven. I can go right across the street to the Harriman House and go talk to a raven probably tonight. Yeah, people love jockeys, and you're right. I know they do love jockeys. You know, and the ballots. I mean, I've you know I've known them all my life. But it's just not a hands-on kind of a sport. Well, great. So any more questions? We'll let John. Yeah, I have them here. Uh, not a ton, but I do have some if anyone's interested. 